Hello and welcome back to the Win Your Podcast, the podcast for when you're doing anything. Today we're talking about when you're watching Bridgerton Season 1. Now, I had never had much interest in the show. I never really cared about it. I remember when they were like pushing a lot of the new Netflix stuff and this was one of the... I kept seeing it all over my... Uh, is like the new releases or like the the thing on Netflix where it kind of tells you like this is what you should be watching. You haven't watched this yet. You should definitely check this out. Like and, and all those other stuff. And I was just kind of like I had no interest because it was just another period piece. And I felt like those were kind of already they, they were kind of already overdone. I was just kind of like how much more can we squeeze out of what happened back then? You know I feel like what's more modern or like. Uh, what we're doing nowadays is so much more interesting. It's so much... It feels a lot better. You know, I feel like there's a lot more that we could do with being here in what's modern. And instead of trying to make... Uh, try to rewrite history or create a different fairy tale around what once was. I, I didn't like that. I was just kind of like, I had no interest in it. And I had zero desire to watch it. Until one day I was just bored and eventually I caved in. And I was just like, you know what? Let's see what this is about. Let's see if uh, if this is actually what I think it's going to be as opposed to like what, what it ended up actually being. And I have to say, it was kind of what I thought it was, but it was like in a good way. It was kind of like, you know what you're getting yourself into, but you're kind of like, but they do it well. They do it in a in a good in a good way, I feel. So, if you've never seen the show, spoilers, um, I always feel like I forget to mention that, but this is definitely spoiler warning. If you're old enough to watch it, watch it. If you're not, sorry, this ain't for you, okay? Anyways, I feel like this show, I mean, at least the first season, had a lot of characters that I mean, it definitely felt brand new, and I definitely enjoyed some of the characters, not not all of them. I'm not in particularly a huge fan of the Featheringtons, but I do like that they're constantly working. I do like that they're constantly trying to overcome their circumstances or where they are in their life. Like in society, like amongst the other families, you know? I always felt like that was... They, they kind of like felt... Like a working class family that's trying to live high class in a way. And I definitely like that. It definitely puts uh, a lot of conflict and a lot of problems. And it's something I think um, a lot of us can relate to. Is that, like there's a problem. How do we fix it? How do we overcome this? How do we stay where we are? Become better, you know? And elevating status, you know, going up to a, a higher uh, place... Is definitely on everybody's mind, especially in a in a house full of women. So, season one focuses on Daphne Bridgerton and her whole family, or like kind of in this upper class, high level thing, right? And Daphne is trying to find a husband. She's at the age to marry, which I'm guessing is hopefully at eighteen. Um, and I say that because, you know, obviously now it's that age, but maybe, uh, yeah, I'm just going to say she's 18 in this, you know, at least hopefully, hopefully she's older. I would hope she's older, but just as a baseline, she's 18, right? And so her older brother, Anthony or Anthony or however they, I forget how they, she said, I think it's Anthony Bridgerton. He's guiding her because... They don't have a dad anymore because he died and he's been left to be in charge of the household. And apparently the man has to find the mate for her. He gets to choose and blah, 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 blah. So he's doing this, right? And he's pretty brutal with everybody. He's like, that, that guy's not good enough. That guy looks good. But let me tell you, that guy has all kinds of problems. You don't want to marry him, nor this guy, nor that. You know, it's definitely like a, a picky, picky, picky. And he drives away anybody who could possibly 
like genuinely like her, like genuinely care for her. But I guess he's kind of doing it for the family and also for Daphne's best interest. But again, it there's something about the the old school ways of like you have to marry for status and for wealth and and all this other stuff that feels so that I like but I also don't like, you know? It's like if you come from a wealthy family, of course you're going to find somebody. If you're working or you're working for, uh, you know, if you're so-called a peasant, or if you just work a regular job, it's very difficult. And I always felt like that never really interested me because uh, like watching shows like The Office, you see people who are both working class people. They're They're not like the richest people on earth but they make a good living for themselves and they find love and in this it's not about finding love it's about finding the right partner finding the right person who will care for and and pay and do all of that stuff for you you know because you're of a a certain class or it'll elevate you to a certain class and such but anyways Daphne is looking for a husband She's looking for her husband and she has to go through the whole the whole spiel, which is ballroom dancing, um, going on like dates, getting new dresses, and attracting potential male uh, attracting the male gaze, their eyes all have to be fixated on her. And that goes up tremendously when the queen points at her and calls her the um what's it called? Diamond of the first water. And so they so she specifically points her out and says she's the girl that every guy should want to be with. And that's where everything takes off. And Antony just starts knocking down potential mates or potential suitors for his his uh his sister. And then well, it all comes down to one guy in the end. I'm talking about Burbrook. I I hate that guy. That guy, I mean, there's not a lot of people that I hate. I mean, I don't in particularly hate the actor. The actor did a good job. He did such a good job that I hate his character. But you know what I mean? It's like, gosh, this guy sucks. So anyways, Burbrook ends up becoming the, the main suitor for Daphne. And if you don't know who Burbrook is... Again, I said spoilers, but if you don't know how, if you don't know who this guy is, I mean, he is just a nasty old, like, I mean, this guy is not suitable for Daphne. Like at all. It, it's quite, it's quite disgusting, really. And so he ends up being the last guy and the brother is like, you're going to marry him, Daphne. Like, it's already been decided. It's, a man's word has already agreed to this. My word. And that's final. And then Daphne's like, no, this sucks. And she ends up, like, going against her brother and Burbrook. And Burbrook is like, I will take you if I want you. And then Daphne's like, no, you won't. And punches him right in the face. And then who shows up? Who, who, who shows up? But the Duke. The Duke right? His name is Simon. Um, I forget like his last, like what his, his main thing is, but he's a Duke, right? And dude, I tell you this guy, they call him a rake. He's just a ladies guy, a ladies man, you know, quote unquote, he's, he, he really be hoeing out there. You know what I'm saying? But can you blame the can you blame the guy? You know what I'm saying? That guy could definitely get anything he wants. You know what I'm saying? He's wealthy, he's rich. I mean, ooh, same thing. He's oh, the Duke of Hastings. Name is Simon, right? The Duke of Hastings. And I got to tell you, dude, they make a good match and they cannot and they come together, right? Because Obviously, all the girls want him, the Duke of Hastings, but he's not really committed. He doesn't want to be committed. He just wants to have sex and roam around freely and travel the world, right? He doesn't. He's uh, 
uh, what is it? Soaking his wild oats or something like that. Sowing his wild oats. He's just putting it out there into the world. You know what I'm saying? So he doesn't want to be tied down. But Daphne needs more male suitors. She needs more men who are willing to marry her, who want to marry her. So what do they do? The Simon, the Duke of Hastings, goes up to um, goes up to Daphne, looking over Burbrook's punched face because he saw the whole thing. He saw Burbrook try to take, uh, try to take Daphne by force, and then he was like, "Oh snap! Let me go in there and stop it." But she punched him right in the face and knocked him out clean with a, uh, a black eye. He comes over and he's like, "Listen, you need to be." attract uh, you need to attract male attention and i need to get all of these mothers who are trying to get their daughters to marry me off of my back so why don't we form a un why don't we trick everybody into thinking that we're a couple when in actuality we're not so we're gonna dance we're gonna do the whole sh the, we're gonna do the whole charade we're gonna showboat a little bit think that we're in love but we're actually not and then what I, and then when did, what ends up happening they trick everybody. And now she's getting all the attention from men that she could ever want. Daphne uh, starts being a high, what the queen stated, a high-profile lady. So throughout the, throughout the season, we see the relationship between the Duke and Daphne start to bloom. They become genuine friends and nothing more. Right. They 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 can't they can't quote unquote do it because she's a lady and he is a gentleman. And by doing so, he would dishonor her or, uh, you know, take away her innocence. And by doing that, she will be less suitable. She would be less uh, desirable to be a wife, you know. So. It's this back and forth between the Duke and Daphne of like, all right. The Duke is like kind of like dancing with her and then men start coming up to her and he's like, ah, oh, darn it. You can't steal my woman. He's like trying to get, uh, act jealous so that people will want, want her. And it works. It, it works like a, like a, it works like a charm. You know, it gets all of them interested. And then we see a little bit of backstory on the Duke. We kind of understand why he's a rake. Why he doesn't want to be married. And we find this is because when he was a kid, he would stumble on his words. Or maybe he, he wasn't uh, in particularly a good talker. He, he had a, a speech impediment that made him mumble over his words or couldn't speak properly. And his father hated that because he wanted excellence in his family he needed excellence in order to maintain a high level of status and he called his son an idiot and he would constantly abuse him and show him no love or affection he wasn't even caring about his son he didn't even care about the mom when she gave birth it was mainly about like did i get a son did i get a boy did i get a boy and when he did he was like proud of the baby and then the mom died and he was nowhere to be found it was just like, what is going on? There was no love. There was genuinely no love. It was only about increasing his, uh, passing down his bloodline, passing down, you know, who he is and like the family name. And when it became about that, I mean, the Duke was just like, this guy sucks. So eventually, he grows up and he's able to speak proper. He grew out of, uh, he practiced and practiced and learned and learned and learned how to speak really eloquently, how to speak properly without mumbling, without stuttering so much. And his father was like, wow, you've really improved. But he still doesn't love him. He still doesn't care. He's just like, he's still an idiot. Like, you know, who, who, It really felt like there was no space in his heart for his son except for be excellent and that's it. 
And that's that was really difficult on him. And so eventually, he looked at his father on his deathbed after growing into a man, after turning into a man and finally realizing himself, finally becoming a man of value who is going to take over his father, father's place as the Duke. And he looks him in his eyes and he tells him, I'm never going to be with child. I'm not passing down your bloodline, you, uh, you evil man, you. And you understand it. You're kind of like, yo, I get it. I'm, I'm with you, dude. Like, imagine knowing that your father wants only kids so that way his bloodline can be passed on through generations and generations. Well, I'll tell you what. Screw that and screw him. Essentially, when he was such a terrible father himself, I mean, come on. There's no, he doesn't deserve that. You know, he doesn't deserve to have that passed down. And now maybe some of you are thinking, oh, but what if he wants to be, would be a great dad. You know, he would love his kids. He would do that. Nah, dog, that guy doesn't deserve to have grandchildren. He doesn't deserve for his sons, you know, his bloodline to continue. And I feel like if he, you know, I feel like kids are, are truly uh, are a blessing and they can be really good for you. But for him, it's more about like him finding, you know, genuine love, I think. And like if he had it, he would, you know. That's why he keeps himself so distant from people. Why he doesn't really talk to a lot of people or want to talk to a lot of people so that way he could protect himself because for so long the person that was supposed to love him the most wasn't there you know and maybe things would have been different had his mom had, had his mom not died from his birth and i guess that also carries in a certain amount of guilt but it it definitely made me feel for him and i was like i understand what you're going through dude do 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 what you want to do, you know what I'm saying? And so going forward, eventually the Duke and Daphne develop feelings for one another. Who would have guessed, right? And it felt so genuine. It felt so good. It felt like they both really had a connection. And it wasn't so much about, it wasn't even so much about being, wanting to be married to one another. It was just about them being friends and then taking it to the next step. Like if they could be boyfriend, girlfriend for a while, I think things would be so much better than, than just having to be married like right away. But at the same time, these are the times and this is how it has to be done and they long story short they they want to get married they want to get married as quickly as possible so that way uh any gossip of them kissing or like doing uh any intimate moments together in secret won't spread out because one of the featheringtons i think caught them or somebody some girl caught them together and she will gossip and make Daphne less suitable, right? Or, or less desirable. And when that becomes known to, you know, that Daphne and the Duke had like a thing, Antony goes to the most extreme thing and he's like, we will duel. We will duel tonight. Uh, I mean, tomorrow in the morning at dawn. And so they have to like get two pistols and then shoot at each other, right? And Daphne has to stop it to tell them like, hey, hold on, we have to get married. We have no choice now. People know about about us. We have to get married. And so that's what ends up happening is she stops it and they have to get married together. And the queen kind of stops it all. She puts it at a halt. She's like, you shall not dare marry, marry that man, you know, because I said so. Oh, because the queen also set Daphne up with the prince, with a, a genuine prince, like her nephew, I think, or somebody, or his, uh, yeah, I think it's her nephew or, or whoever, right, is a prince, 
and she sets Daphne up with him, she could be royalty, a real princess. But she chooses the Duke because the Duke is awesome. So they have to go to the queen and ask her for their marriage license to like speed up the process. And in doing so, the Duke lays down a fire monologue of love and passion and friendship that all unites into them having this deep connection, this deep love for one another. He's, he's telling her his thoughts and feelings out into the open. And it, it is beautiful. I can't recite it line for line, nor would I want to, but I'm just saying that moment hits you. It hits you in the feels, you know. And then eventually they get married and they do what lovers do. And that's get it on, baby. Get it on. There was so much sex in this show, in this season in particular. I mean, when I did... You knew, you know, it happens, right? It's natural, it's normal. But, I mean, there were so many moments where I feel like they could have alluded to it, right? Like, they didn't have to, like, show it, I guess. It, it just felt like every second, every minute of the day was like, yo, let's get it on. So they start getting it on, right? And you start noticing the Duke pulling out, right? The dude is trying not to, not to get her pregnant. Because he told her, I can't have children. And Daphne thought, oh, so there's something wrong with him down there. Like it has to be broken or destroyed and whatnot. And then later on, she's kind of like, I thought his inability to have kids would be like bad for the, for the sex. But I was wrong. And I'm glad to be wrong. Little does she know, she doesn't know why he's pulling out or what's going on down there. She, she's so oblivious. Nobody teach, they don't teach anatomy. They don't teach that. They don't tell you how any of that happens because it's such a, a taboo thing, such a, a whisper, a, a hush among the crowd, you know? Normally because everybody who does it is looking to have kids, but this is different. She, but, and Daphne has no idea. Her mom doesn't even tell her. And it's inappropriate for the brother to do it and like anybody who's not going to marry her so that's what that's what's going on. And then there becomes this battle where finally Daphne figures out the truth that it's not that he can't have kids, it's that he won't have kids because he hates his father and doesn't want to increase his bloodline. That Daphne does what any woman in her position has to do. And she rides him like like a horse. I mean, she just starts going to town and she's just like, you will get me pregnant. She's just going to town on him. You know what I'm saying? And then all of a sudden, it boosh. And you think that's the end of it. And then their marriage starts to crumble. You know, it endures a hardship. But sad to say, Daphne doesn't get pregnant. She, she gets her period and, um, well... She's very heartbroken, to say the least. Because she wants she wants a family. She wants kids. And I felt sort of like Daphne was kind of overstepping. Especially when they agreed before they even got... Or, or when they got married that, like, he was enough. And they were enough together. Like, I don't see a problem with that. But it is something that she wants. And it is something that she's always wanted. And it was kind of like everybody pushing against the Duke of like, change your ideas, change your values, change everything that you've lived through, all the pain, all the anguish. And I was just kind of like, no, I'm still on the Duke's side here. Like, I feel like he has every reason and should be able to keep his ideas. You know, that's the thing is like, because they're married, getting a divorce is so bad, but it's, it's, it's unacceptable. They can't do it. And being unhappy just sucks. So if they were just dating, they could just break up. But no, right? That's There's always a problem. So in the end, they ending up changing the Duke on his mind. And they have a kid together. They have a baby boy. And I must say, I, I do have to say this, dude. I I feel like... All the pushback was all always about like, you could be a good father and you can give the, your child the love that you didn't have. And I was just, for the life of me, I just wanted the Duke to be like, you weren't 
there. Like you didn't feel what I felt. You didn't experience the years of torment I went through because of my father. And I don't want that. I don't want to be that. I don't, that's not who I am and it's not what I want for myself. And kids are, for some people, they're not for me. And I don't want them. You know, you weren't there when I was being verbally abused, emotionally abused, discarded, treated like garbage. You weren't there for all of the, my whole life growing up, being resented and overall disowned and hated by my own father. And now all of a sudden you want me to change just so you can have a kid. I, I felt like that was, that was something they need to say, something that felt so right, something that they couldn't refute or push back against. And I know I'm supposed to like side with Daphne and I get it. You know, me personally, I'm with Daphne. I'm like, yo, you could give your child all the things that you didn't have. You can change. You can change the blood bloodline. It doesn't have to be this nasty thing that your dad created or, or turned, uh, turned into or behaved like. You can be different. But at the same time, it's kind of like... I understand your reasoning. I understand why. And I feel like, you know, obviously today, I think it would be a lot more accepted. But I also feel like it's a it's a big change for him. And it's a change that I, I don't think needs to happen, but I understand. And in changing his perspective, he gives Daphne what he wants. He's able to have build so much more he's not so lonely anymore you know and that's that's where i feel like the growth comes from is accepting to let people in and to to become a, the best version of yourself and i and i like that i like that a lot for him and for daphne in the end everybody ends happily ever after and then we go on to the next season which i'll talk about probably another time i don't know when but I feel like in the second season, it's just kind of like, it focuses on Antony. Antony. And there were so many characters. There's so many things I didn't talk about in the first season. Uh, Daphne and the Duke aren't even my favorite characters in this whole thing. I mean, I like them for sure. But I think my favorite character is probably Eloise. Eloise, Eloise and the Duke. I, I do like the Duke. Yeah, so I, I, it's between those two. Eloise and the Duke are probably my, my, my favorite characters. And if you haven't watched the show, you'll you'll understand why I think. Or not. Who knows? But anyways, guys, thank you guys so much for listening. I hope you guys uh, enjoyed it. Thank you so much for subscribing on YouTube. Thank you so much for listening on Spotify and other uh, on the other platforms. It means a lot to me. And... I'll see you guys all next time. Thank you.